it's really great to be here at Google I.O. I hope you're having a really great day. Um, I'm Rachel Andrew. I'm the content lead for Chrome Developer Relations. And that means that my day job is working with my team to land content on web.dev and developer.chrome.com to help you understand existing and new features that are becoming available in browsers today. This talk will share with you just some of the features that have become available across browsers recently. There's a lot of things landing, but these are features that I think are ready for you to at least start to learn and maybe even to implement in projects because they're all interoperable and part of baseline newly available. Before I talk about the features, I'd like to talk a bit about baseline to put into context the browser information you're going to see for each feature in this talk and in other talks at Google I.O. I've been working as a web developer and also creating content for developers for a very long time. And because of that, I know that new features that come into browsers are really exciting and that you like to know about these new things that have been worked on by browsers. But I also know that it's not always easy to use these new features due to differences in browser support. And even when the features are available in all browsers, it's not easy to keep up and to know what's ready to start using. Now, my experience as a developer and as talking to developers is backed up by research that we've done at Google and also by surveys that are run in the community, such as the state of CSS. So in some research that we conducted, 21% of developers told us that keeping up with new features in web standards is a top challenge. This came a really close second to the, the very top challenge, which is testing end-to-end -end user flows. Also, 21% of developers told us that keeping up with changes in web standards is a, is a top challenge. So when we add you know, a new feature to an existing API, how do you know that's happened? And how do you find out about that change and whether it's ready to use? And then another top challenge, and I think something which has been a challenge ever since I started working on the web back in 1997, is how do you make a design or an experience work the same across browsers? Now, the thing about these challenges is they come up every time we run these surveys. They're always at the top of the list for web developers. So to help improve things, we launched Baseline at Google I.O. last year as a method to easily tell when features are ready for you to use. And we've been developing the concept over this year, working with the WebDX community group. It's important to know this isn't just a Google thing. This is something that we've been doing more broadly uh, with representatives from other browser vendors and also from the community. So that group acts as a governance group for Baseline, and it helps to ensure that a broad range of opinions and experiences are reflected in the decisions that are made. So a key thing we had to do this year was figure out how to define Baseline. The features that you're going to see in this talk are all what we call baseline newly available. That means they're interoperable across our core browser set, which includes Chrome, desktop, and Android, Edge desktop, Firefox desktop and Android, and Safari, macOS, and iOS. If something is baseline newly available, you'll see that it's indicated by this blue logo. And you'll find this on Can I Use and MDN already. So you know at a glance that a feature is part of this group. Now, when something becomes baseline newly available, it might just have become available across browsers, perhaps even this week with the browsers that have released this week. But you know it's there. It works in the same way everywhere, and it's a clear part of the web platform. Now, some features in that newly available group can be used as an enhancement with a fallback or even a polyfill. But it's likely that if you're reaching for something that is newly available, you're going to have to put some thought in as to how to support people who don't have it yet because they've got older browser versions. Eventually, though, features get to a point where you don't have to worry about using them. It's very unusual for browsers not to have them. You know, perhaps you've been working on the web long enough to remember when the new HTML5 structural elements were so new 
that you needed a polyfill in order to use an aside or an article element. Now, I don't think many people are doing that today on a brand new site. So eventually, new things become old things, and you don't need to worry about them anymore. So to indicate that group, we have baseline widely available. If something is widely available, it's likely that you can just use it without thinking too much about non-supporting browsers. And it's indicated with this green logo on sites like MDN and Can I Use. So a feature becomes widely available after 30 months have passed since it became newly available, so two and a half years. And this line was agreed by the WebDX group as the point at which most developers can safely use a feature. So unless you have some very specific support requirements, you can pre feel pretty safe to use widely available features. We also have this orange badge, and this shows things that have limited availability. So perhaps they're only in one or two of the browsers. They're not available everywhere. Now, you'll see these badges used in many of the web talks uh, live here and also in video for Google I.O., as well as increasingly across the web. And if you talk or write about web platform features, you can use them as well to help clarify the status of features that you're describing. So, Let's take a look at some of these newly available features. First up, we've got size container queries. And they let you change your design based on the width or inline size of a container, rather than only being able to target the size of the viewport as you can with media queries. And they enable more reusable components that can modify themselves based on the available space when they're placed into a layout. Container queries behave much in the same way as media queries, but because they're querying a container rather than the viewport size, you first need to define the element that is the container using the container type property with a value of inline size. You can then use at container in pretty much the same way that you'd use at media to test for a minimum or a maximum size, and when those rules are met, you can apply some CSS. So in this case here, I'm turning a card into a two-column grid when the container is more than 500 pixels wide. So I've got a simple card here that displays using normal flow, and then it turns into a grid layer when there's enough space. You'll see more examples of container queries in the web UI talk at Google I.O., and also in our resources on web.dev. Now, container or element queries are something that developers have wanted for a very long time. The first mentions of being able to do something like this were in 2011. And that's only a year after Ethan Marcotte introduced the idea of responsive design. And what I've shown you there seems really straightforward. There's not a lot of code. But for a long time, it was thought that container queries might actually be impossible in a performant way. But building on CSS containment allowed a solution to be developed through the CSS working group. Of course, once people realized this was actually a possibility, they started to ask for it to be made interoperable, giving browser vendors a really clear message through surveys like the state of CSS. And the clear demand for this feature was a really large part of it being included in Interop 2023. I want to talk a little bit about Interop because the project's now in its third year. And it's an annual benchmark where all of the major browser vendors come together to work on some of the most highly requested interoperability issues that developers are facing out there on the web platform. Now, that might be entire features, like container queries, or it could be some smaller compatibility issues or bugs in otherwise generally interoperable features. Many of the features I'm going to talk about today became part of Baseline Newly Available due to their inclusion in Interop 2023 and 2024. And there are many features currently part of that Interop 2024 set that will hopefully make it over the line through the rest of this year. If you want to follow along with this year's Interop story, you can follow along on the Interop dashboard. And the scores there are based on the number of web platform tests that features pass. So each passing test indicates a problem that you won't run into. So Interop is a really key component of our aim to improve the web platform as a whole. So size container queries, they became interoperable and part of baseline newly available in February 2023. 
and you can see their status on MDN and Can I Use, along with the browser versions that support them. So this gives you that information that you need if you want to know if you can start to use them. Now, container queries will become widely available in August 2025. So from that point, we'd expect that most developers can consider this feature available to use without needing to consider that there might be people without support. So from one impossible thing to another, the has selector gives us another thing that's been a top request from developers for many years, a parent selector. So a way to select an element based on what's inside it. Now, as with container queries, this is incredibly useful when you're creating reusable components, as you can create a single component that can adapt to what it contains. So here I have a simple card component, and I'm saying, you know, if this component has got a figure and some content, display it as a grid layout, as two columns. And so you end up with something like this. It means that you can check and see if there's an image, and if there is an image, we'll have it in two columns. If not, we'll not leave a space for the image. So this is a very simple example, but has can help you to create more reusable components by using CSS to check for the contents and styling accordingly. Now, saying that has is a parent selector kind of simplifies it. There's a lot more that you can do with has. So on web.dev and developers.chrome.com, we've got resources to help you find out more. Again, in the State of CSS Survey 2023, has actually became top of the list of features that developers could not use due to browser incompatibilities. So it also was part of Interop 2023. It became baseline newly available in December 2023, and therefore will become widely available in June 2026. So now we have a feature that is very dear to my heart. If you know me, you'll know that I do like my grid layout. And level one of the CSS grid specification became interoperable in 2017. And therefore, grid itself is part of baseline widely available. So at this point, you're very safe to use grid layout in your sites and applications. Now, there was a part of the early grid layout spec that was removed to enable the rest of the specification to be implemented, and that was the concept of subgrids, the ability for a nested grid layout to inherit the tracks from its parent. So here's a really simple example of one of the key use cases for subgrid. So in this code, I've got a wrapping element that contains three figures. Each of them has a caption. I create a grid for the wrapper, so each of my figures goes into a column of the grid. Each figure is also a grid item, which lets me stretch my image over two rows and overlay the caption in row two. And this is allowing me to do a nice square um, grid image with the caption overlaid. Now, that kind of works, but as you can see, if those captions have differing amount of text, they don't align with each other. And that's because the internal grid on each figure is independent of every other figure. Now, it's this example is where subgrid is really useful. So to change this to using subgrid, I move the row definition to the parent, making two rows there, then span the figure over the two rows on the parent. I give grid template rows a value of subgrid, so now the track sizes come from the parent rather than being defined on the children. And the captions now line up, because they're all in row two of the parent grid. So if the sizing of one changes, it's going to change the entire row. If you inspect the parent grid with Chrome DevTools, you can see this really clearly. Now, exactly how subgrid should work was a subject of a lot of debate in the CSS working group, and that's why their introduction was delayed until a later level of the specification. A key decision was whether subgrid should be locked to two dimensions, meaning that in that case, you'd need to know exactly how many rows and columns that you needed. The delay meant that we had a final specification that allowed for single axis subgrids, meaning that you can, for example, lock your columns to a parent grid, but have as many rows in the nested grid as you like. 
So Firefox ships an initial, initial specification in 2019, but because they shipped quite early and then a lot of changes were made, um, there were changes made to the specification from that point. But Subgrid was the fourth highest response to the question about browser incompatibilities in the state of CSS 2023. So it was added to Interrupt 2023. And so browsers that had already done work to implement, they fixed some of the bugs or changes to the spec that had happened, and Chrome landed support. And that made Subgrid baseline newly available in September of 2023. So CSS Grid Subgrid will become baseline widely available in March 2026. And now to a feature that we might think of as sort of a developer convenience feature, because in recent years, CSS has taken inspiration from the features that you've been using in preprocessors such as SAS. I think most people have been using these preprocessors to help streamline development. So we have things like CSS custom properties, known as CSS variables, and they're a widely available feature that allow for variables such as colors to be set in one place and used throughout your CSS. Now, that was something that was previously only available if you used a preprocessor. Another feature of preprocessors is nesting. And this is something that developers often have asked the CSS working group for, you know, why can't we have nesting in CSS? Because it helps to avoid repetition of selectors, and it helps to make CSS far easier to read because you can group related things together. So in this example, without nesting, every selector here is declared separately. And this can lead to related selectors getting split up in the style sheet, making for a more confusing authoring experience, or people just going and adding the same thing again somewhere else because they don't know that it exists. With nesting, we group the style rules. So it's very clear when you look at the CSS that these things belong together. So nesting was a really popular feature of preprocessors. And so once it became part of a CSS specification, that made its way pretty quickly through the CSS working group and landed in all browsers in 2023. It became baseline newly available in August 2023 when it landed in Firefox. And while it's classed as newly available, it's also part of Interrupt 2024, just to make sure some small remaining issues across browsers are completely fixed. Um, as of April 2024, nesting had a 74.4% interrupt score, and most of the failing tests were interactions between nested CSS and the Shadow DOM via host. So CSS nesting will become widely available in February 2026. So stepping away from CSS for a little bit and looking at HTML, because we've got the HTML search element. Now, search is something that appears pretty much everywhere. You know, most sites and applications have some kind of searching going on. But until recently, there was no element to mark up functionality that's used for searching or filtering on a page. And the search element was designed for this purpose. It's purely there as an element for you put inside it a search form or any other elements that are used for filtering results. So in this example, search is used to contain a search form. It could also be used to containing filtering controls or any other functionality that performs searching on your site, whether that's site-wide or searching and filtering data in a large table, for example. It shouldn't be used to contain search results, but it's valid to have more than one search element on one page. So you might have a site design where in the header, you've got a search element that is containing your site-wide search and another for a filtering widget on a large table of data. The search element does thing really useful in that it creates a search landmark. And so you don't need to add an ARIA role of search to indicate the purpose of the area to assistive technology. So once search was added to the HTML specification, it was pretty quickly added to all browsers during 2023. It landed in Firefox and Safari in September and Chrome and Edge in October when it became baseline newly available, really within a month of landing in the first browser, which is quite impressive. 
Um, therefore, it's going to be widely available in April 2026. Now, as with other HTML elements, there's no problem with adding the search element to your pages right now. Uh, Non-supporting browsers will just treat it like an unknown element, so they'll display the contents anyway and treat it really like a div. Uh, you'll probably want to double it up with a role of search on the form until the search element is classed as widely available. And now we have responsive video. Now, for a long time, we've been able to mark up images with the picture element. And when we do that, you can add different sources with a media attribute to indicate which image file best serves the device being used to view the content. So you could add you know, a very large image for big desktop screens, and you could add smaller optimized images for mobile, and even different crops and so on. We've been able to do that with picture for a long time, but we haven't been able to do it with video. So with images, if you've got this code, the viewport has a minimum width of 699 pixels, then the wide image is going to be shown. Otherwise, the small image is shown. And you can add as many source elements as you like, and the first three matched will be used. Now, as I say, this wasn't available for video, which seems quite strange. And it turns out that at one point, it was in the HTML specification, but it got removed. And what happened then is it left Safari with an implementation of responsive videos, which they never removed. But other browsers had no way to do this, no way to serve appropriate video to users based on attributes such as the screen size of their device. So having identified the need for responsive video and learning that it had existed in the specification but had been removed, Scott Gell raised an issue on the HTML working standard, which reignited discussion on the feature. After two years, Chrome and Firefox expressed an interest in implementing, and support was added back into the HTML specification. So in this sample, you can see responsive video using the source element inside a video element. The video is responsive because the first source has a media attribute indicating that it should be chosen until the viewport is larger than 449 pixels, at which point the large video should be displayed. Responsive video became baseline newly available in November 2023 when it landed in Chrome, and therefore will be widely available in May 2026. You should really feel happy to start using this far sooner, because browsers that don't support responsive video will pick the first video specified, which is essentially the situation that happens if you don't use the media attribute. So people without support aren't going to get a worse experience than they're getting today anyway. And those that do support responsive video will see the performance gains of getting optimized video for the device that they're using. Now, given the impact of video on performance, on data costs, and energy consumption, this really is a big win for users and is a very straightforward thing to be doing. And so staying in HTML, and with another real win for users, when, when an element is inert, it can't be interacted with. Now, you'll see this if you have a dialogue element. Uh, the elements that are behind the, on the page, behind the dialog, can't be clicked or tabbed to. And the inert attribute gives you a way to control inertness on any part of your user interface. If you apply the inert attribute to an element, click events won't be fired if the element is clicked upon. The element can't gain focus. The element in its content is hidden from assistive technologies because it's now excluded from the accessibility tree. And that's the really important part, because it means this attribute can trap focus in areas that should be interactive, rather than letting someone end up in part of the interface that shouldn't be active. It can also be applied to elements that should be off screen or hidden, to make sure these aren't exposed to the accessibility tree and therefore accessible by screen readers. So here's an example where I've applied the inert attribute to a div. Now, the second div here is inert. I can't tab or click the link if this was live. Now, what's important to note here is that the div that's inert doesn't look any different. So adding the inert attribute doesn't come with any inbuilt styling. That's down to you. 
if this was live and you held your pointer over the link, you'd see it doesn't turn into the expected pointer for a link, but there's nothing else to indicate inertness. So you can target inert elements with an attribute selector. So in this case, I've made the element opaque. Now, how you should indicate inertness really depends on your use case. Um, if it was important that something was inert but still readable, if you made it opaque, it might be hard to read. So you'd need to figure out you know, how to do that. Um, but I think in most cases, the inert thing is probably off screen. And the reason you're making it inert is for the assistive technology, so it doesn't get sort of trapped in it. Um, so in that case, the lack of visual indicator is not a problem. The inert attribute became part of baseline newly available in April 2023, making it widely available in October 2025. So now to something more colorful. And something really cool happened in 2023 with CSS Color, this huge step forward with new color models being available, along with color functions that allow you to create colors in your CSS. So first, the new color models. These essentially enable high definition color on the web. So we have a whole bunch of new models taking us away from RGB color. Now, if you want to play around with these, this is uh, something that was built by one of my colleagues, Adam Argyle. This is gradient.style. You can play with these new ways of using color and make some really nice gradients. But that gives you a real visual representation of how much more color we have to play with on the web. But along with these, we have new functions. And one of those is color mix. And this lets you mix one color into another in any of these color spaces. So here in this example, I'm mixing 25% of blue into white in the sRGB color space. But as I say, you can do this with any of the new color spaces as well, and do that right in your CSS. Now, these features became baseline newly available in April 2023, so they'll be widely available from October 2025. So staying in CSS, um, as well as built-in form validation that, that we now have and more advanced validation you can do with constraint validation, there are CSS pseudo classes that are applied based on validation state. Now, we've had for a long time the pseudo classes valid and invalid. They're widely available in browsers, and they indicate whether a form element is valid according to any constraint rules placed upon it or invalid. So if you have a field with a type of email and the user has put a name into that field, the invalid pseudo class will select it, and you could use that to then add a color or icon to demonstrate it needs to be corrected. Now, the problem with the valid and invalid pseudo class is that they apply before the user has interacted with the form field. So if you have a form field that's required and the user hasn't completed it yet, your invalid styling will show. Now, that's not a great user experience. Typically, we only want to tell someone they've done something wrong if they've you know, clicked into that form and then, and then gone away from it. So these pseudo classes improve the user experience in that situation user valid and user invalid behave in pretty much the same way as valid and invalid, but they only come into play once a user has interacted with the field. So with the example of a required field, the user needs to have clicked in or tabbed into the field and then moved away for the field to show the invalid state. These new pseudo classes became part of baseline newly available in October 2023 and will be widely available in April 2026. So they give you better control over the interfaces you put in front of your users. And here's a JavaScript feature, just a small feature, but again, one that can really help you out. Because most web applications need to provide downloads to, to users. You know, you might need to download a compressed zip file. Now, in the past, if you'd wanted to do that, you'd have to include a compression library, which increases the size of the application for everyone, even if you don't want to use the download. And compression streams gives you a built-in way of compressing a stream of data. So here, I want to let the user download a large log file. Using a readable stream, I can compress the data using gzip. A small feature, but it lets us remove third-party requirements. Compression streams became baseline newly available in May 2023, 
so it will be widely available from November 2025. This is a great feature to polyfill. Uh, you can use compression streams when they're available and a third-party library if not supported. And then we have the declarative shadow DOM. Now, this is a way of creating a shadow tree from HTML, whereas previously you could only do that from JavaScript using attached shadow. Being able to do this from HTML is really useful in environments where JavaScript might not run. It's also very important for server-side rendered components. So this is the old method, how to create a shadow DOM from JavaScript. Now, this makes it difficult to use in conjunction with server-side rendering because there's no way to built-in way to express shadow routes in the server-generated HTML. And there are also performance implications when attaching shadow routes to DOM elements that have already been rendered without them. So this can cause things like layout shifting after the page is loaded, or you get a flash of unstyled content while the shadow root style sheets load in. With the declarative shadow DOM, however, we can create a shadow DOM by using a template HTML with a shadow root mode attribute. No JavaScript is needed to produce the entire tree, including the shadow root. Declarative shadow DOM is now part of the HTML living standard. It first appeared in Chrome in 111 and was quickly implemented by other browsers. And it became baseline newly available in February 2024 as part of Interop 2024. It will become widely available in August 2026. It's uh, possible to build a simple poly polyfill for declarative shadow DOM, first checking to see if it's available, and if not, scanning the DOM to find all template shadow root mode elements. Then you can convert those to shadow roots on the parent element. Now, in this case, you're going to get some of the drawbacks experienced prior to declarative shadow DOM, but already many users will get the improved experience. And then the final feature is the most recent feature to become newly available, popover. And there's some crossover between popover and another fairly recent feature, the dialogue element. Dialogue is part of Baseline Newly Available and became interoperable after being a focus area in Interop 2022 and will become Baseline widely available this year in September. Dialogue lets you create modal dialogues with an inert background. But there's another type of pop-up that doesn't cause the rest of the page to become inert. These non-modal pop-ups get used for things like menus, custom toast notifications, and content pickers. Popovers can be created from HTML by adding the attribute popover to the element that contains the content it should show as a popover. And you then display the popover by adding a button with the popover target attribute with a value of the ID of the popover element. That can have a value of show to show a popover, hide to hide a popover, or toggle to switch between show and hide states. You can also create and control them from JavaScript by using the popover property of the HTML element interface. Now, there's a few things to know about popover. You get a lot of functionality without needing to write code for it. Um, auto is the default if you just use a popover from HTML, or you can set that in JavaScript. If a popover is in auto state, it can be light dismissed by clicking elsewhere on the page. And things like clicking escape on the keyboard will close it. And you can only use one popover at a time. Um, if a new one gets shown, the first will automatically close. If you want full control, use a manual popover, and then you will need to provide the closing functionality. But this will let you use multiple popovers at once. And popovers move into the top layer, so you won't need to fight with Zindex in order to make sure it ends up on top of everything else. It's a really exciting feature for the web platform and became based and newly available in April 2024, so widely available in October 2026. So that's our 12 features. And Popover is a really new feature for the web platform. And you might have been surprised that it or other things are actually already newly available. So part of what we hope to solve with Baseline is to give you better ways to understand the progress of features. So when something is being developed, when will it become interoperable? And how can you follow along? One way that we're answering this question is with the web platform dashboard. 
Now, throughout this talk, I've tried to show you how browser vendors work together to make features interoperable. So they then become part of baseline newly available. The Interop project has shone a light on a subset of features for the last few years, allowing everyone to follow on on the Interop dashboard. But with the web platform dashboard that we're announcing here at Google I.O., you'll be able to see the entire web platform mapped as a set of features along with Interop status. We've never had this kind of visibility on how the platform is evolving. For us at Chrome, it gives us a new way to identify the places where we need to improve our implementations to have better interoperability with other browsers. The dashboard has web platform tests as a key data source. They highlight failings that might be edge cases in a highly interoperable feature, but if you're the person who hits that edge case, they really matter. Since the web platform dashboard is focused more on engines than browsers, it's likely that for many developers, the overviews on can I use and MDN are going to be more useful day to day. But I think there are a few use cases I'd like to highlight for those of you who like to follow along with web platform features. Perhaps you'd like to see everything that's part of baseline 2023. That would make a great list of things to consider learning about and seeing if they make a difference on projects you're working on. You might spot a feature you hadn't realized existed there. You might write an article about features and want to know everything that's become newly available in the last three months, so you can filter the view to have a look at that. There might be a key web platform feature that you're really excited about and you want to see it become part of baseline newly available. You can follow along with progress by viewing the feature with a timeline for score changes. As a writer, I'm really excited to use the dashboard to help with my own work. It's going to make creating content such as new to the web platform on web.dev much easier. Now, the dashboard you can visit today is a preview launch with a full list of features included in baseline 2023. We'll be backfilling data through this year in collaboration with everyone working on web features. So baseline is already very helpful today with the messaging on MDN and can I use along with the web platform dashboard, you've got many new ways to learn about feature availability. The dashboard will hopefully help you see features as a collection. If you decide that your users are likely to be using browsers that include features that are in, say, baseline 2022, you can see that group of features on the dashboard to identify the things you have available. And you can check individual features to make sure they're baseline 2022 or older. But doing that for your entire code base is a lot of work that would be better done by tooling. You should be able to tell your editor or IDE that you'd like to stick to baseline 2022 and get a warning about features that are newer than that. You should be able to tell your linter and CI tooling about that too. So on larger projects, everyone's aware and you don't ship features that don't have support. Now, the first step in all of that is to decide which baseline version you need to target. Now, other platforms have this same issue, but platform owners can provide some guidance on the distribution of users across versions so developers can make that trade-off. But nothing like that exists on the web. The web is not versions. There's no owner of the web that distributes it and can make recommendations about which versions to target. So we kind of end up picking different browsers and their versions and trying to find data on distribution. So to help with this, we're really happy to announce that Akamai's RUM archive has been working on a solution to that problem. And we'll make available today a new tool for developers on RUM archive insights. For the first time, you can see side by side the global user share of baseline versions and features that are unlocked with that version of baseline. And you can use that today on rumarchive.com slash insights. This addresses the issue of a baseline version for a new project. But if you've got a very specific audience on your existing site, you'd probably like to understand the impact of using new features on your existing user base. So we're working with Rum Vision to address that issue. And we'll have more to announce later this year. So we're working on tooling providers already with integrating with baseline. But this is an area where we need your help. If you work on tooling for developers, check out the data we're making available via the dashboard and consider building support for baseline into your tooling. 
So with Baseline, we really hope to improve the platform, but also improve the experience of developing for it. The features I've shown you in this talk all have huge promise for improving the experience for us as web developers and also for the users of our sites and applications. I've shown you features that we once thought might be impossible to provide in a good way, such as size container queries and the parent selector capabilities of has. You've learned about features designed to improve developer experience, such as CSS nesting, taking inspiration from preprocessors and things that developers are doing outside of CSS. We've looked at the inert attribute, a feature that can have a really big impact on accessibility by trapping focus in the right place, making sure that hidden content is really hidden and unable to be activated no matter how users are browsing the web. There are the JavaScript features like compression streams, the declarative shadow DOM serving the way that modern web applications are developed, and popover, one of a new type of element, giving an easier, more accessible way to build a common component. And these 12 features are not everything that's recently become part of Baseline newly available. One of the ways you can use Baseline is to look at everything that became available in a given year. If perhaps you think our definition of widely available includes features too far in the future, you could decide to adopt features that fall before a particular baseline year. If you adopt baseline 2023 as your baseline, these are all the features that became newly available and are there for you to use. And if you want to get excited about what's coming in 2024, here are all of the features that we already know are part of baseline 2024, and we're not yet halfway through the year. There's plenty of browser releases still to come. You can follow along on web.dev with the announcements from today and lots of information about all of the features that I've mentioned. You can use the baseline graphics in your own articles and presentations. We really hope that this new way of viewing the platform will bring more clarity to developer content and give you better ways to discuss browser support with your stakeholders. Thank you very much for listening and enjoy the rest of Google I.O.